do. Very good. So, um, I'm Robin Spiller. I'm a gastroenterologist from Nottingham, United Kingdom, and it's my pleasure to co-chair this with Jim Fukudo, who's from Sendai in Japan. Uh, and we've got, we've heard uh, so far this morning something of the epidemiology and the differences between different cultures, and now we're going to try and move to mechanisms and pathophysiology and try and drill down on those features which are specifically gastroenterological. Um, and it's a great pleasure now for me to introduce Nick Talley. There's Nick. Okay, so Nick's um, uh, a professor of medicine and pro-vice-chancellor and dean of health at the University of Newcastle. Uh, the words global and Nick go very well together because, of course, he started off Australia, spent a quite a long time at the Mayo Clinic, and now back in Australia. So he spans the world. And uh, Nick, we're going to have a global perspective on the effect of genetics and ethnicity. Thank you, Robin. It's a pleasure to be here. I have a complicated presentation. I've tried to simplify this, and I'm going to have to uh, not uh, have time to show you all the evidence, but I'll try and pull some of these themes together and also give you my own personal opinion about some of these issues, because the, the data actually, uh, as you'll see, in terms of the global picture of ethnicity, the global picture of genetics is not clear-cut, and, and I think that's the bottom line. So we're dealing with a public health problem, and obviously the public health impact of IBS will vary around the world, which means we need to understand the underlying pathophysiology. And as you all know, the pathophysiological links have uh, included uh, genetics, have included psychological factors, about which we've heard quite a lot this morning, and have included environmental factors, all of which may be critically important in leading to this disorder and indeed the subsequent impact of this disorder uh, in various communities. But uh, the conceptualization of IBS is complex because this is clearly not one disease. At least I don't think so. In fact, I think right now the overwhelming evidence suggests we should abolish the term IBS and be talking about subsets of what we now call IBS. For example, diarrhea predominant IBS seems pathophysiologically absolutely distinct from constipation predominant IBS in my mind. And I'm no longer convinced the one term covers one disorder. I think we're dealing with very different disorders. You could argue how to divide this up, but I don't think it's the same problem. I've already mentioned there's a complex interplay here. I'll co cover this in a moment. The problem is when you look at the country-by-country country evidence, and you saw some of this this morning, it's all over the map, which is very confusing. So I've actually asked the question in this presentation, does the concept of phenotypic IBS, e.g. Rome 3 criteria for IBS, that's phenotypic IBS, is that in fact a model we can apply worldwide or indeed should we dump this and think about something else? And I guess that'll come to discussion. So let's turn to genetics. We know everything is driven by genetics. It has to be. It's all nature and nurture. There's been discussions about every disease, nature versus nurture. And when you get to the bottom line, you always find it's related to both. So clearly genetics must play a role if this is a disease of any kind that we, re we recognise and not a purely cultural phenomenon. So is this a genetic disorder? And the answer appears to be yes, but you could argue it depends on which country you live in, if you believe the data. So here's the first study to actually show there was a genetic uh, liability to IBS. This is the twin study from Sydney, Australia. Small study relatively, confirmed in other, in other countries. I'll come back to this. But basically showed there was a genetic component, but there's also an environmental component and a strong environmental component. Then we have a study that appeared to be rigorous, used the Rome criteria, the Rome 2 criteria, had a, good, uh, had a good study design and basically said genetics did not matter at all. This is a psychological disorder. So if you live in the UK, based on these data, you might argue it's a psychological disorder. You might. And then if you look at other studies, and there are now five twin studies, if you look at studies from Norway, two from the US, 
both of which I had involvement with in the US, those studies clearly show there's a genetic component. So why do we have a negative study and essentially four positive studies? And I guess I just want to remind you, it's just like in clinical trials. There are 95% confidence limits around data sets. You will find outliers that essentially occur by chance. The UK study was well designed and probably wrong, I think, based on what we know. And you've got to be really careful to interpret one study as an outlier and then say that's truth because in science it doesn't work that way and we sometimes forget it. So there appears to be a trait hypothesis. There's a genetic set of factors that presumably lead to IBS. There's a strong environmental set of factors. But there's also this overlap. We keep not discussing this very much. We talked about functional somatic syndromes. They overlap with IBS. In GI, there's a whole host of other functional GI syndromes that overlap with IBS. There's almost nobody with pure IBS. Well, there are some, but not very many if you look really carefully and comprehensively. So this suggests, and these overlaps don't occur by chance. These overlaps are not due to chance. There's lots of studies all showing the same results. So this sort of uh, trait hypothesis suggests there's basically a functional GI syndrome. Presumably there are environmental factors and genetic factors that lead to unique phenotypic presentations, but that does not... Uh, take away from the fact that there is, in fact, a real disease here, a real pathophysiology, and I want to emphasise that. Now, what about ethnicity? Uh, If ethnicity is important for genetic or for environmental reasons, we should see real, real geographic variation in the prevalence and natural history of IBS, assuming we're measuring the same condition when we actually assess this country by country. So is this the truth? We heard this morning it might be, and I'm going to argue, first of all, it should be the case. For example, if you look at post-infectious IBS, a clear risk factor for IBS, everybody agrees. Some people have argued this particular meta-analysis has some flaws, which it may, but the message is the same. Post-infectious IBS is critical. If you live in Mexico, you get a lot more gastroenteritis than if you live in Australia. I think. It therefore should vary dramatically across countries depending on your exposure. The next issue is the flora is different across the world. We're just starting to unlock the microbiota. I think the microbiota is going to be critically important in the pathogenesis of a number of disorders, including some of the functional disorders. That's a hypothesis that needs to be tested. But I would argue if flora is different, the prevalence should also be remarkably different. And then what about diet? Diet is different across the world. Having been to many countries, and I love to travel, uh, I can tell you diet differs. We know that. We know fibre intake differs. We know uh, uh, non-absorbable sugar intake uh, differs. This is the basis for the FODMAP diet, by the way. Reducing those sugars, which seems to work based on good Australian data, which others are replicating. So basically, all sorts of dietary impacts, perhaps even breastfeeding, which we know varies around the world. Who knows? That could be a risk factor for some of these disorders. It should vary. There isn't much data here, but therefore we should see geographic variation. So if you look at the Rome criteria for IBS, and uh, this is one of the summaries of the data, and you look around the world, it does vary a little bit, but there are 95% confidence limits around these studies. And if you look at this critically, I would argue the data all fall essentially within the 95% confidence limits, with a few studies on the outside which, frankly, should be thrown out. They should be ignored. They do not count in terms of this assumption. This looks like a prevalence that, by the way, hasn't changed for 30 years, as far as we can tell, so there's no increasing incidence, and it looks around the world like everybody has this somewhere. Wherever it's looked for, you find it.
There was an excellent systematic review. It's a few years old now, from 2005, by Jin Kang, who basically looked at East versus West. And these are based on some of the older studies, and you heard some of this this morning. I'm not going to summarise all of them. I do not have time to do so. But in essence, no convincing evidence of differences across East and West. I would argue, although we haven't done a systematic review update, and we should and I would argue that should be one of the outcomes of this meeting, we should do it well, rigorously, and across the world. But if you look at this, I'm reasonably convinced Jin's right. There isn't much going on. There are some potential ethnic differences within the US. I do not know if they're real. I do not know. The methodology is not necessarily comparable enough. This is data that... Uh, uh, Professor Gui mentioned earlier, and again, you can see there are some outliers here, but I would still argue this doesn't look very different to me. I'm not convinced there are regional differences. I'm not convinced, although you never know. And so I think at this stage we are stuck, although I will acknowledge this. In Asia, certainly in India and some other places, there's no doubt the dyspepsia overlap with IBS is a significant potential confounder, and we don't account for this in the Rome criteria, and my goodness, we better start accounting for these sorts of important differences in future criteria development if they're to remain of any relevance in terms of the future, which one could discuss. If you look at studies within Europe and in Israel, you also see symptom variation, and there are symptom variations using different measures. This actually used the bowel symptom uh, measurements that we developed uh, years ago. This wasn't a study that I did, though, and there were some regional differences, and I do not know what accounts for some of these, and indeed, this may be more important than looking at global IBS-type criteria overall. And I also want to point out that the socioeconomic differences for IBS are, are not yet worked out. Is this driven by socioeconomics or is this driven by ethnicity? Remember, socioeconomics could be important because if you are exposed to a lower socioeconomic background, more infection risk, a different immune response that you actually intrinsically develop, Th1 versus Th2, and that could be critically important in pathogenesis, yet we're not really sure if there's a socioeconomic difference. Some studies say IBS is more common in high socioeconomic groups, but the majority say it's the other way around, which I think is really interesting. So I don't think we know at this stage that ethnicity is important. I would argue the jury is at best out and based on the data that I've reviewed for this uh, presentation, I'm not convinced at all it's primarily of importance. I'm sure this is debatable, and that's why I'm uh, strongly making my point. I want to debate this. What about differences in pharmacological response? No data. No systematic data. And I didn't have time to review the world's literature, pull out all the studies and look for these differences systematically. That's a huge job, a job that would take a team and a lot of money but may be worth doing. But placebo response vary. So maybe they do vary ethnically and geographically. And why would they vary? I would argue it's going to be pharmacogenomics is going to be important here as part of the answer. It won't necessarily be cultural. We know genes influence response. They're important. So far, there have been 600 genes looked at in IBS. Yes, 600. There's only 24,400 to go, approximately. OK. <laughs> And if you look at these associations, and by the way, most of these studies are dreadful, absolutely dreadful, and I'll talk about that tomorrow, later in this uh, conference. The point is we don't know enough about this, but we know pharmacogenomics is going to be important. We know this will be the way of the future, and I know, we know there are significant ethnic differences in pharmacogenomics because the genetic profiling differs across ethnic groups, as you would expect, in small subtle but critically important ways. So one gene that's been looked at, for example, is the CERT promoter. This is this uh, insert in the uh, serotonin transporter gene, which actually is uh, upstream of the gene itself. 
And that's been looked at. And if you look around the world, this genetic association with IBS has been tested and it varies across the world. I don't have time to go through this in any detail, but there's a heterogeneous distribution of CERT. In the two US studies on this slide, <laughs> the genetics look a little different in those two populations as well, which actually argues the populations aren't necessarily representative of the US population. So even within the US, this, this varies, so you're going to see differences. And Mike Camilleri did an elegant study showing a particular polymorphism, uh, a particular SNP, was relevant to changes in transit with a drug that affected serotonin. And this was the long homo uh, homozygous polymorphism, basically a very small study. By the way, it hasn't been replicated, although it makes intrinsic sense. And what he basically showed is the long polymorphism in the CERT promoter is associated with a greater colonic transit response to a serotonin type 3 antagonist. That was a locitron. And that's because basically with the LL homozygous gene, you get more serotonin uptake and therefore there's less serotonin around to block. So it makes great sense. As we can tell, increasing incest suggested this. It's probably true. And there are other cert polymorphisms that might be important. Can't talk about them. GN beta 3, another polymorphism, has also been linked to response. This is data presented by Gerald Holtman showing an association of response and antidepressant use in functional dyspepsia. I'm out of time to talk about that. But there are also other polymorphisms that may be relevant. For example, in cytochrome P450 and antidepressant use. And indeed, there's even a commercial chip available in the US to test for this and uh, some are suggesting we should be using this when we prescribe antidepressants for IBS, which we do frequently. So, ladies and gentlemen, we know genes and environment both are critically important in IBS pathogenesis. I think IBS is a real disease. It's too heterogeneous to lump it together. That's one of our problems with IBS but I guess we're somewhat stuck with it at the moment. I would argue our current classification scheme is wrong. Plain wrong. The question is, what is the classification? And that's a different discussion. Um, the role of environmental factors seems to be the same around the globe. There's something we've missed, ladies and gentlemen. We have missed a major environmental factor around the world, because otherwise IBS would differ everywhere, S be dramatically different, tenfold different, perhaps. We don't see it. It's not there. Whatever this environmental factor is, it isn't the things we've been studying. We're missing something. Pharmacogenomics is different ethnically, will drive our response to treatment. That's clear, although we need to know what the genes are. It's going to be a long road to find them all. Thank you.